Not everybody's well, but some of us are, so we're excited for that. We're excited for that. We're going to continue in our little mini sub series out of the sub series of 1 Timothy on church membership. And so um, while we're continuing to look at the church, uh, continue to read 1 Timothy because we will pick up there soon in the weeks to come. But today I want to continue in what I've now entitled uh, The Beautiful Church, a little tiny little series called The Beautiful Church. What, what are we to be? What is the church supposed to be about? What are some things that the church should know and understand as it relates to the teaching of the New Testament? And um, so today we're going to look at two specific places in Scripture. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 18. So you can turn there with me. And that's the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 18. And then we're going to reference several other passages and several other places. Um, but we're going to also look at the tone and the nature of Paul's writing to Philemon. That's sort of like a proof text for some of this. So here we are in the Word of God. Here we are together as the sheep of Christ. Here are we wondering, you know, what's next on our plate? Where are we going from here? And what do we need to know? What do we need to be doing? Well, the beautiful thing about all of that is that we can know what we are to be about because the Scripture gives us that information. There's a great mystery in the world called the gospel. Paul said that it was shadowed and covered until the day of Christ, until the preaching of the apostles to preach Christ. It was revealed. Christ is the mystery unfolded. He is no longer a mystery for us. We know him, we see him because he knows us. And the Christian life is, is not about what the culture has said that it should be. Being a Christian in America, being a Christian in Georgia, being a Christian in the southeast region of the coastal empire and low country, we are not supposed to take our cues from the world, from the churches of the world, from the habits, from the historical essence of everything that has ever taken place. What being a Christian is all about is not the bumper stickers, the t-shirts, the knickknacks, the Hobby Lobby. Scripture on the wall, pictures on the table. Real men love Jesus. That kind of stuff. This is not Christianity. This is not living for Christ, living in Christ. This is just like putting icing on dung. Now, I know a lot of dogs who would eat that. Some kids would try it. Some well-meaning brave men probably would too, but we wouldn't eat it. The grotesque idea of that type of food is the way I view cultural Christianity. It's what, it's what I feel in my spirit. It's what I feel in my heart and mind. It's what I think about, and it, and it drives me to a place of of brokenness because people play the game of Christianity they play the game of church and every preacher who's ever stood in the pulpit we don't play games here I mean that was my motto back in the early 2000s I could raise my hand and I say what's my motto no and everybody in the entire congregation would say no games I'm not playing games here and it had a context <laughs> So everybody who's ever preached has said that. Everybody who's ever preached is saying the exact same thing that I'm saying today. Everybody has the same sentiment, but not everybody is talking about the same thing. Because there's always a mindset with the man talking that he has a picture in his head or a particular person's or person or a particular type of ministry, a particular congregation or a particular denomination. There's always something there, right? And for those who may have a similar picture, they're going, yeah, I agree with you. Amen. You know, the amen corners. We amen 
what should be called platitudes and cliches. But we often don't amen true shepherding of God's people. We often don't amen the solidarity of the unity of the whole counsel of Christ. There's nonsense afoot in, in our world today, even amongst sovereign grace or so-called slash reformed or so-called so -called slash, you know, Calvinistic or Baptistic or, or whatever, you know, whatever your historical moniker might be for a particular iteration of a theological system. They're in that lies a problem. Because just as many of you and I have had conversations about things, we can say the same word for months and not even be on the same page. My brother Trey and I are going to have a conversation sometime the next week or two about the invisible church. Because <laughs> what I mean is not what he means. Some people might think, well, what are those, the empty chairs? The invisible church? <laughs> no. We are here, commanded by Christ, to be a people for His glory, to display His manifold wisdom. Psalm 104, all the stuff that God has done, all the things that He's put His hands on, all the things that He feeds. And yet, both songs that we just sang, the lyrics of those songs are found in Psalm 104. Isn't that coincidental? I decided to read it. So I opened it up. I, thought, I haven't read this song in a while. I'm going to read this song. Not a whole lot of pre-planning and pre-service readings. So we're learning, and if we're going to learn about who God is, and we're going to worship, we're going to thank Him, some people say, oh, God is so good, and when they say that, what they're meaning is, God gave me a car. Or what they mean is, God gave me a spouse. God gave me health in my body. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Beloved, we should praise God for every small, minute detail of our lives. As I sat down to lunch Wednesday, I didn't eat anything Thursday, Friday, Saturday. No, no. As I sat down to lunch Wednesday, I'm looking at this food. I'm thinking, this is immaculate food. This is, this is amazing food. Had some cream corn in there, some chicken in there. Some collard greens. Good stuff. And I'm thinking, my goodness, in the scale of the world, this is gourmet royal food. Gourmet royal food. And there was some kind of carrot cake in there that was just like it, somebody had dropped it in the floor and scooped it all up, put it back in the bowl. It was delicious. Delicious. We should be thankful for that. We should be thankful for the potato chip that we might only eat. We should be thankful for the lack of food. We should be thankful for the lack of health. We should be thankful for the lack of relationships. We should be thankful for the troubles and the trials and the problems because blessed be the name of the Lord in the context of Job. He cries that out when he gets news that God, God, has killed his children for no other reason but to show himself faithful in the heart of Job. Now see, if you don't know the Lord of the Bible, that upsets you. And when I'm not saying if you're not saved, I'm talking about even for the believer who hasn't truly learned as part of the body. Not only who God is, but then who we are in relation to Him. To display who He is. The church is to do that. And we do that, this is review, we do that in two specific general categories. We do that in the proclamation and the defense of the gospel of free and sovereign grace. True gospel. There are many, many, many false gospels. Any gospel that is a variant of the truth is a lie. And we disavow all of them, but we do, not, we do not destroy those who believe it. We love them and we evangelize them and we bring them close and we disciple them and we do whatever we can do. 
out of the cost of our own lives and time that God may be glorified in their redemption that has already been accomplished and finished at the cross of Christ if they belong to Him. And then the second part of that is that we grow to learn and understand and rightly divide the truth of Scripture as a people in order that, now listen to this, in order that, so maybe there are three things, in order that we might live as a people together for His name's sake, by His grace. Sound familiar? We are a people for His glory by His grace. And that's cliche. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So last week we looked at a dump the marble bag on the floor church membership. And today we're going to focus on that a little bit deeply, more deeply, in what I believe is an imperative reality of the local church, and that is to understand church discipline. To understand what it means, what it is, biblically speaking. And I could go anywhere in the New Testament. I could go to any New Testament letter. Any New Testament letter. And there is church discipline. Any New Testament letter. But because we have institutionalized the Kirk, the church... Because we have institutionalized Christianity, because we have socialized and made it a club that's beneficial for not only us and our, you know, our kicks to do spiritual things, but it's also a way for us to be active and this, that, and the other, and also good for our business, good for our reputation. I might want to run for public office one day. I need to be in the right congregation. Hogwash. Hogwash. We are here so that we can live as Christ has commanded us to live. With no exceptions. And we're here in covenant with one another. That means a promise. Understand that God's covenant with His people is irrevocable. And it's unconditional in the context of what we must provide because he has provided for himself a lamb for the slaughter. I want you to hear this. This is theological things. These are the revelation of God to his people. This is the spirit that teaches us these things. And so I want us to know this. I want us to understand this. And there are some other things that I'm going to go through in the next few weeks in rapid succession. I've already talked about leadership, elders and deacons. We've, we've gotten that under our table. We've gotten that on our table. I'm going to talk about worship. We talked a little bit about gifts and service of the ministry last week. We're going to talk about preaching and its point. We've talked about prayer already. I'm going to emphasize with a complete sermon about what is biblical fellowship. And then I'm going to talk about the responsibilities of the individual members of the church in these ways, including financial support and giving and responsibilities of ministry and service and other things related to life together in our culture in the 20,000th century, 21st century. I had to think about that for a minute. But today we're going to talk about discipline. So I want us to hear the word, and then I'm going to opine for a minute, and then we're going to get into the text. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus, there's a lot here. There's a context here that's so difficult to absorb if we're not really in it. And, and, and I'm willing to say that few of us have read the gospel of Matthew this week. So for the sake of the theme... Jesus is teaching his disciples. And they've come to him, and they've been talking amongst themselves, and they've come around, and, and they've all started, you know, well, you know, I'm better than you, you're better than me, blah, blah, blah. You know, John, you're the most humble. Peter, you're the most passionate. You know, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Sort of like most ministers. They think Christianity is a competition. They think that congregationalism is a competition. They think the ministry is about what we can provide to make the community want to be in here. 
The same thing that happened in John chapter 6 when Jesus provided a meal for 10,000 people miraculously. And then he said, now all I'm going to give you is my flesh and blood. And they went, you're nuts. And every single one of them left. So when we preach Christ, unless God calls people to that desire by the Spirit, they're not going to stick around forever. Your relationships and your friendships in life are key to your evangelism. They should be the centerpiece of it. But your evangelism is not moving to a decision by that person to believe something or accept something or receive something or do something or acknowledge anything. Your evangelism is the means naturally through which God will, by the Spirit, regenerate His elect people when He desires and only when He desires. So as long as people in my life are willing to put up with my constant exposure to Scripture in every aspect of life, um, they can hang around. And we'd be fools when someone asks us about something biblical and even when they're so far out in left field that they seem like they're brain dead, we'd be fools to rebuke them and belittle them instead of just sit down with them and teach them the truth. Timothy says that this command flows out of love, right? Jesus' disciples love themselves. They did. Just like we love ourselves. Who's the greatest, they said. And Jesus, in chapter 18 of Matthew, he, he brings a child. And he puts a child. A child. I'm not talking about a middle schooler. I'm not talking about a fourth grader. I'm going to talk about a second grader. I'm thinking, like Julia, a child, a preschooler, a walking, toddling, whatever. And he stands this child in front of his disciples. He says, truly, I say to you, Armain, it is so that I say to you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Don't you, don't you hear that? Don't you hear that? And there's, there's a reason why we're starting there, so that you can get the tenor of what Jesus is teaching. His disciples that he chose, who were following him, who were doing miracles, who were preaching the gospel, who were being used by Christ to bring about his glory visibly, he, they were like, who's going to be the greatest? He said, you need to change how you're thinking, because if you're not like this, you're not even getting into the kingdom of heaven. Same thing he said in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus. Got all the right theology. Nicodemus wasn't wrong. Nicodemus was blind. Nicodemus was dead in his religiosity. He was dead in his theology. He was dead in his prophecy. He was dead. And Christ made him alive. How? By the Spirit. God the Spirit. Poof. What does it do? It changes our minds. We no longer focus on any other means. We no longer focus on any of these other things. We trust in the proclamation of Christ alone as our righteousness. Period. And the context here is he's saying whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Faith of a child. Dependence of a child. Humility of a child. But yet what do we tell everybody? Grow up. Paul tells Timothy that, doesn't he? Do not continue in childish ways. Well, he's talking about childish means, childish attitudes, childish mindsets, childish activities, but not childish faith. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin. It'd be better if a brick was tied around his neck and he'd be drowned in the sea. Now that's Jesus. Jesus, that's not very loving. 
Of course, I'm not Jesus, and neither are you, and none of us have the authority to act or speak that way to anybody. This is Jesus teaching his disciples. It wasn't a prescription. It was a picture. So then he's talking about those who are tempted to sin, those who lure other people to sin, those who cause people to sin because of the way they approach, the way they live, the way they speak, the, what they do. He thinks about the rebelliousness of things. And then he asks, he says, you know, you got a sheep herder and he loves his sheep. There's livelihood, but he relates to these sheep. He's taking care of these sheep for years. And he's got a hundred and one of them wanders off. He leaves the 99 intact and he goes and finds the one. This isn't prescriptive either, by the way. This isn't what we do. Okay? We don't run after goats. We don't run after rebellious people. It's just a picture that when God the Father, through God the Son, by the power of God the Spirit, saves, regenerates one of His sheep, rejoicing, celebration, and thanksgiving is the outcome. Then verse 15, which is our text for this morning. If your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault. Between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take a few others along with you that every charge of his sin against you may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. What are the witnesses there? They're listening to what you say. They're witnessing you. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Now he is talking to and only to his disciples, but this instruction is carried over into the apostolic writings of the New Testament. We see Paul talking about it in Thessalonica. We see Paul talking about it in Ephesus. We see Paul talking about it in Corinth. We see it, church discipline. So church discipline, when we think about it, if I, if I said, okay, everybody this morning, due to recent events, is under church discipline, we'd have a stomachache. Well, what happened? Well, for those of you who were in the fellowship last week, we got into a food fight. No, I'm just joking. Everyone would start to think, what did I do wrong? But discipline isn't always about what's wrong. Discipline is sometimes about what is not right. And discipline, by definition, is loving correction. Loving correction. I have severe tendonitis in this elbow. And it's awful. It's awful. And part of the therapy that I have to do is take this little vibrating devil stick from, from Hades and rub it on that spot and rake it down like this and then divide it like that. I'm supposed to tear the tendon a little bit. And when I turn it on, the cats, it sounds like a purr. And they get all up on me trying to figure out what new cat this is. So it's doubly, it's painful, very painful. But it's necessary for me to heal. That's discipline. Discipline, we've already said this, is twofold. It's formative, you got it, and corrective. Formative and corrective. So if we were, and I won't go, I won't read through Philemon for the sake of time, but if we were to go to Paul's writing to Philemon, it was formative. Philemon did nothing wrong. He had all legal means to arrest Onesimus. He had judicial means to imprison him. He stole from him. He violated the law in two ways. And he had every biblical right to have Onesimus arrested and put in prison. Because Onesimus stole from Philemon and then abandoned, abandoned 
his post as a slave. And we're not going to get into the ethics of slavery. It's wrong. But Jesus didn't come to the world to deal with ethics. He came to the world to display his glory and redemption. So Paul meets Onesimus, and through the gospel, God converts him. And so now Paul says that he is, that Onesimus is his spiritual son. And when he finds out what Onesimus has done, of course Onesimus as a new believer is repentant. In other words, his mind has been changed. He knows now when Paul confronts him about the fact that he stole and ran away that he should go back and be a slave and face his punishment. But Paul goes a step further in formative discipline by writing Philemon and saying, Philemon, I've met your slave. He's wronged you. Legally, you have all means. Biblically, you have all means. But for the sake of Christ, there's a different way. I have a right! But is that right wise in the nature of gospel? So formative discipline would be like what is taught. What is taught to the people of Ephesus. What is taught to Philemon. When he comes back to you, he's going to be more valuable to you as a brother. He will serve you now more than he ever would have as a slave. Even though as a slave he should have served you as Christ. As if you were Christ. As if you were serving Christ. Now he's coming back to you as a brother. So it's going to be doubly beneficial for you. And when he comes back, his debt is paid. He owes you nothing. And I encourage you to receive him as if I were coming to you. Open your arms and your home and your life and your treasures to him as if I were coming. Formative discipline. So see, it's not always because somebody's in trouble. And Philemon could have easily said, I hear what you're saying, Paul, and I hear that it's wise, but right now I need to do this. And Paul would have probably written another letter. Second, Philemon, <laughs> I don't think you're hearing me. Then it would have been corrective, you see. So formative discipline is oversight through preaching and teaching, instruction. Formative discipline is, happens to the ordinances, what we learn and remember and obey through the Lord's table and through public baptism. Formative discipline is, is loving service, learning the one another's. Have you ever gone through your Bible, no matter what translation you use, and, and look for the one another list? They're everywhere. There's tons of them. Love one another, respect one another, help one another, serve one another, and so on and so forth. These are commands. These are commands that are given to us through the teaching of the New Testament. And if we're not doing them, we are disobeying God. But the formative discipline through the teaching that we might learn what we ought to be doing because it's the therefores of the Bible, because of the gospel, because of Christ, because of grace. Therefore, live this way, act this way, think this way, behave this way, reconcile this way. And then that's what brings us to the next part of discipline. It's done out of love in both sides because the love that Christ has for us in giving of himself, the mind of Christ, as Paul teaches to the Philippians, should be ours and is ours because we have this mind in Christ. Because we have it, then we can walk in it. We don't often walk in it because we're not disciplined enough to be in the assembly to learn to do so, nor have the opportunity to get face-to-face -face enough with people that we feel comfortable opening our lives to them so that they may serve us and us them. But there is the corrective side of discipline. When the prior formative, instructive, teaching discipline is ignored, is rebuked, is qualified by certain conditions or rebelled against, bringing disunity, frustration, fear, suspicion, arrogance, and public shame to the name of Christ then corrective discipline happens. Corrective discipline is happening every single moment of our lives. Every single moment. In every aspect of our life. It's happening all the time in our church. I am disciplined many times during the weeks. You are disciplined many times during the weeks. It's not like going to the principal's office. 
the elders have to write letters to correct simple things through the teaching and instruction of Scripture, we've missed the point. Some of you have said, Tippins, your attitude, you have a bitter spirit. That's church discipline. And if I say, mind your business, dummy, now you're on my poop list. How can you preach the word of God and have a poop list? You see. And of course, that's a ridiculous example, but it happens all the time. It's when someone decides to double down and then rebel against the disciplined things that the Bible teaches, like gathering together, like submitting, like being quiet, like not gossiping. That it comes a problem. The very nature of the occasion of 1 Timothy is that people wouldn't stop to give the elders time to manage and oversee and correct the issues. This is taught and commanded by Christ right here in this text. Let's go through it. 15, verse 15, Matthew 18. If your brother... Stop right there. So this is talking to you. Let's just let's misapply the Bible for a minute, and let's just replace the disciples with you. No, I don't want to do that. But you know what I'm saying. There is an application here that he's given these men who then teach the church to do the same thing. First and foremost, he teaches something in the epistles. The Bible teaches us in the letters that the elders are responsible for corrective and formative discipline. Not individual members of the church. Why? Because wouldn't it be something if I open up my Bible to preach and then one of you said, I'm sorry, Pastor, um, I'm bringing so-and-so before the church today. That's well, the first I've heard. Can it happen? It can happen and it has happened. Some of you have witnessed it recently. For those of you who have been around 10, 11 years, we've seen it happen several times. And we've seen reconciliation a few times. And we've seen expulsion. And we're still waiting for reconciliation. But the scripture will teach that church discipline, corrective, and here's an incredible thing that you're going to go, wow. And formative discipline, discipleship, same root, discipline, is about keeping and growing relationships, isn't it? It's about when it manifests problems with relationships. When you've got two people sitting on the front row and they're in, they have discord, and their discord, because of their friend circles and because of their intimacy with other people, begins to cause fear in the hearts of the church. It's wicked. It's demonic. It's evil. And I say that because that's what the Lord says. That's what Paul says. There is no such thing as the Spirit of God causing fear and division in the body of Christ. Well, the truth will always divide. Not that way. The truth will divide through proper, orderly, obedient, humble, loving correction according to the scripture. And any other way is satanic. And any other person who insists on that, they themselves are Satan's puppets. Dogma like that bothers some people. And some people have told me that, even recently. Pastor, when you say that, it just bothers me. And I'm sorry it bothers you. And maybe the Lord will show me that I probably should just say it with a little less emphasis. But my, I don't know what my heart rate is, but I know my heart rate's higher when I say that. Yeah, it's 68. That's high. No, I'm just joking. I can feel it. I feel, you know, oh, I just want to get down for a minute and take a little breath. Jesus gave the apostles the, quote, keys of the kingdom, that in their writing and in the commands that, get, that God gives us through them, we are able to do, lock and unlock, receive and not receive, judge and not judge accordingly. So if your brother sins against you, 
If you don't consider him a brother, and any time in the process, you go bye-bye. Your voice is shut. Your mouth is zipped. Your, your platform is nil. Because you've passed judgment. Yeah, but he said, yeah, but he did. You notice how most of the time Matthew 18 is invoked when someone's upset about something someone else did, but it's not a sin? Or the next part of that phrase, if your brother sins against you. Sometimes we're such busybodies that we're so interested in what other people are doing through our observation, it's because we're not serving. We're not serving Christ at all. We sit on our spiritual hineys worrying about what everybody else is not doing right when we can't see our own problems. That's not okay. We're not going to be a church that allows that. That in and of itself will cause you to be brought publicly before the church if you don't stop after you're told not to. Why? Because that's what the Bible teaches us to do. See, this isn't high attendance day. This isn't bring your friend day, is it? This is teach the church day. And so if your brother sins against you, so what that means is, is that if there is someone in the fellowship of the body of Christ who is your brother, sister, that word is universal, just like mankind is human. If they sin against you, they do something to offend you personally. They've done something to you. Not because you're offended about something. Not because you're offended because they might be wrong. Not because you're offended because of something you observe. You have an obligation as a humble servant and brother or sister to go to them and encourage them in the faith. But you have no responsibility to call them out. But if they sin against you, what are some examples? Do I really have to give them? So I guess you have to decide, is it a sin against me? And if it's not, it's over. And if we dwell on it, we're the sinner. But let's say for the sake of example, it happens and it will happen and it does happen. Somebody says something, somebody does something, somebody says a coarse joke that's out of flavor and it personally attacks you and you feel what do you do hey brother um, when you said that yesterday it really hurt my feelings how hard is that why is that so hard or when that happens this is what I feel not you're a evil person you're so mean and I've told people they're mean because they are after not being corrected there are mean people. There are people who don't care about anything but their ideologies and the way that they think they should handle things because they're Jesus Jr. You know? They're the little spirit. <laughs> Go tell him his fault. You did this to me. You said this to me. And this is what I feel. And if he listens to you, how do you know if he's listened to you? I am so sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I didn't mean to. I apologize. What can I do to make it right? Here's what I stole back. Forgive me. Where do we go from there? Rejoice. It's over. It's over. We don't dig. Well, what else have you done? Well, what else have you said? What else do you believe? You don't do that. That's not what the church is about. So you've gained your brother back. You see, brother, 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 brother. The relationship is mending. Church discipline is almost always about mending relationships. So if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you. Now we have the instruction. This doesn't give us the instruction as the church. This is what the Bible is showing that the apostles were taught in this particular instance. How many more hours of conversation they have with the Lord about this. We know more because we can see. 
We can see what Paul writes about how to deal with things. We can see what the Apostle James says when he writes to the Jewish Christians about their favoritism, corrective discipline, about their gossip, about their wishy-washiness. God called this. No, he didn't. I've changed my mind. God's called me somewhere. You know, this isn't happening. This is happening. Fickleness. It's not of the Lord. Well, I misunderstood. You didn't misunderstood. You just not listened to the instruction of Christ. Take two or three others with you. Who are those people? Spiritually sound, wise, quiet people. Why? So that they can hear you say to the person, you've sinned against me in this way, and I asked you earlier, I, I told you earlier, and you cussed me out. I told you earlier, and you said that I was wrong. It was none of my business because, I did, because you did this to me. Now, what are the witnesses for? Those witnesses must be spiritual. You know what happens if those witnesses go back and tell anybody else? They are murderers. You know what happens if those witnesses get online and ask for personal counsel from other people? They are murderers. You know who you get your personal counsel from? Your elders. Or your spouse. <laughs> because nine out of ten dentists, how do they always get those nine? Because they interview a thousand. And then they take nine of the ones who said yes and one of the ones who said no and say, nine out of ten dentists. I mean, this, come on, statistics, charts, marketing. Friends, we don't do it. So when someone sins against you, and then you go to them and you say, hey, you sinned against me, and then they go sin against you again by telling other people, or you then go tell other people, this person sinned against me, I'm really worried about this person, I think we need to pray for this guy, I think we need to do this, I think we need to do that, this guy's really a dangerous person, this guy's really scared, you know, he's probably going to do it to you. Do you know there are heinous sins that have taken place in the body of this church, in the life of this congregation, that some of you will never know? Heinous, wicked, evil things that have been said and done. And by the mercies of Christ, when the brothers and sisters have gone to these people and said, you know what you did there was an absolute wicked thing and, 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 and I, I can't let this go. You have got to stop. And they've said, I am sorry. Forgive me. I won't do it again. And the relationship grew. So the evidence of two or three witnesses is that the charge has been made. And that's if the person hasn't listened. You know what that means? That means we don't get to decide. How do I decide if a person is listening? If they say and if they give an answer and are willing to talk through it and work through it. That is good. When a person tells you to stay out of their life and to mind your business, then you might need to bring some witnesses. Is it a one-time thing? Listen, we don't get to decide what conditions. Well, unless he says this or does this, I'm going to take it to the church. No. Well, what if three weeks from now he does it again? Ah! Take it to the church. No. It's a new offense. We start over. As long as people are walking in correction willing to learn, even if they struggle. Imagine some sins that we all carry around that we can't escape. For me, it's mostly attitudes, internal attitudes. Bitterness, cynicism, paranoia. Those are three big ones for me. And they're quick. They come on like a wave. It's like, oh my gosh, five minutes later, it's over, but I drowned. I got to do some CPR, get the water out of my lungs. It takes me a day or two, especially when I sin in that stuff. And heaven help me if I do it on a Saturday. That's why I try to avoid people on Saturdays. Because <laughs> the devil works, right? Well, what's the matter? Because you leave my house at 9 o'clock Saturday and have a fight with me, this pulpit's going to be blank next morning. Brother Trey's out of town, we in big trouble. Mike, one of you guys will just have to read the Bible. That's fine. We'll just sing and read and pray. Where's James? Who else sitting here? Oh, must have had a fight last night, you know. Is 
if he refuses to listen to the witnesses, and what do the witnesses do? The witnesses then can, can encourage. Let me give an example, a specific, ridiculous example. I changed the way, one time in a church, of how the offering was taken. You notice we don't take an offering. We don't pass a plate. There's a reason for that. Because it bothered me, the compulsion of the way it was done at the time. And so now that I got away from it, I've just never gone back to it. So we got the box in the back and the, and the internet link and all that other good stuff. But I just did that because I thought it was prudent as a pastor to do these things for the sake of our worship and time together. Because I had a young sister come and say to me one day after service because the deacon was shaking the thing right in her face. She's the only one on the aisle. And so she takes all the money she had, which was $20, and put it in the plate. And after service, she comes up, teared up. That was all the money I had for the week. Can I get it out? <laughs> you know, I'm like, you know what? We're done with the plates. Well, in a leader meeting one night, on Tuesday night, I had this dear older brother. I got a problem, Pastor. And he did it right. I got a problem. What is it? You just think you're God around here. You know, something like that. No. Well, you think you run everything. No. I run the pulpit and the worship service. And that's about it. Everything else y'all can handle. You can cut the grass, clean the building. I don't. Well, who gave you permission to stop passing offering plates? I was younger. I said, God. <laughs> really? And now that we're at it, why'd you put that acrylic podium up there? I said, because the lectern was eight, 18 by 7, and my Bible didn't fit on it. And it weighed 700 pounds when I needed to move it. You know, it was one of those broad pull. I mean, I had to do my notes from this side to the center to this side. <laughs> oh, I need to go back. Literally, it was the size of a piece of paper. Well, nobody gave you permission to do that. 1968, so-and-so built that for the church. Where is it? I said, I gave it to a church plant down in Alameda. Ah! Well, you just... And I stopped, hummed myself, and I said, you know what, brother? I said, you're bringing a charge against me. And we quantified them. And there were two other witnesses in the room. And then those witnesses listened to what he had to say, and I listened, and I said, and if you're right... I will go before the church and confess these sins and ask for forgiveness. I said, but if you're not right, you'll go before the church. Why? I said, because have you talked to him? Yeah, we and so-and-so had a breakfast yesterday about this, you know. And we agree. We're good. Those two witnesses, after 30 minutes, talked to this man concerning Christ, and he got up off his chair, and he walked around and grabbed me. Old man, strong man, and he would not let me go. Like a mama hug, and cried on my shoulder. And we were very close for my remaining tenure there. Witnesses are there to help reconcile. Not have stones to throw when the time comes. Every step of discipline is to reconcile. And when reconciliation happens, even in a small way, we rejoice in it and we continue to grow in it. We have to be patient in that. There are some things that we think are sins that the person's just, their character's different. Their temperament's different. People think I yell and I'm mean and I'm angry. No, I just, I'm an open air orator. <laughs> I coached baseball. We yell, but I'm going to scream in your face. If he refuses to listen to the witness, if you can't get reconciliation of the relationship, repentance. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Take it to the church. Now, how do you take it to the church? Well, call sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, text message, messenger, Facebook, tweet, no. Take it to the elders of the church. Take it to a deacon of the church that the leadership may look at it and present it in such a way that the church can be informed through the pulpit, not through the telephone. Because there's a real specific way that we inform about discipline. Brother so-and-so is accused of doing this and refused to listen. 
We're going to deal with it in two weeks. Call them, reach out to them, because what's the point of taking it to church? That the, everybody in the body who has means and wisdom now can reach out to them. Not to get their side of the story, murderer. To call them specifically to the carpet and the charge of the very thing that they're not doing. What might not be? Not reconciling with this brother. Not listening to the commands of scripture. Not willing to be patient. Not being in the body. Not coming into the context of, of discipline and sitting under the teaching. Taking matters into their own hands. And so on and so forth and so forth. So then the church has a go at it, right? It's not like, oh, here we are, take it to the church today. And everybody knows about it. All in favor? No, there's no voting. I, I, I got mentors that tell me I'm ridiculous for not having a democratic process in the church. I think it causes division by the mere function of it. It's ridiculous. Why would we vote as to whether or not we're going to obey the command of the Bible? All right, well, we're going to change, and I'm going to stop preaching. Uh, we're going to vote on it. We don't want to have no more preaching. Everybody in favor? Everybody opposed? What happens in the opposed? Well, we're leaving. Well, now you're under discipline for abandoning the body. And you think that's funny because it's ridiculous, but I've seen it. And you have too. That's why some of you think it's funny. You've seen it. It's ridiculous. Well, I think we need to vote on what songs we sing. Well, how about the only songs you're going to sing are the ones that we can play? Or the, the person that actually does the picking likes. You want to sing some different songs? Then help pick them. Because you might not think that's an aggravation, but I'm telling you what, Saturday afternoon you go, Ah, I didn't do songs. I mean, <laughs> what do I sing this week? It's, it's, it's a service. We're not going to vote whether or not to obey the Bible. We don't stand up and say, All in favor of expelling this adulterer. All in favor of, you know, expelling this. Or that. That's like saying we get to decide what the Bible says. We get to be God. And then what do we do then with the division? Well, I'll tell you what happens. True story. People showed up for a call by the personnel committee to dismiss the senior pastor of a church that I was on staff with. And he had 40-something people out of 300 in attendance that voted against him. And about 700 other members that weren't there. Or active members. And so, long story short, after the man was affirmed by Democratic vote, he stands up there in the pulpit and says, all you people who voted against me are under discipline. And all the people that didn't show up are under discipline and have two weeks to give their position or they're excommunicated. And the 200 and something that voted for him, if they'd have had hay forks and torches, it would have made sense. Yeah! Now tell me that's unity. <laughs> it's God blaspheming garbage. But that's what we do. And beloved, we've all made silly mistakes like that. So the church gets to come in and then make effort to reconcile this person in simple obedience to the formative discipline of the Bible. If we don't stay where we're supposed to be and do what we're supposed to do and learn what we're supposed to learn and listen to what we're supposed to hear, then we're not ever going to see reconciliation. If he refuses to listen to the church, let him be as a Gentile and a tax collector. What's that mean? You have no more obligation to him. You have no more interest in him. You have no more responsibility to him. He is not permitted to be in our lives anymore until he changes this behavior. I've always found it odd through familial seasons. You know, we've all have this person in our house, in our families somewhere who's always causing problems and causing fights are always causing tension, always got something smart to say. But yet they keep getting invited to all the family events as if nothing's happening. And then they get in your face and they choke you and they slap you and then, you know, 
Your uncle invites them over for a cookout the same afternoon. But now you can't go because you don't want to be choked, slapped. And your uncle's like, oh, what is that? See, that's the problem when church discipline isn't holistically received. When we continue to try to have relationships with people who have abandoned the church, who, according to the apostles, have abandoned the faith. I still believe the gospel. You do not. You say you do, but you do not. If you abandon any of the correction, you've abandoned the truth. Doesn't mean you're unconverted. Doesn't mean you're lost. Doesn't mean that you're whatever. It just means that you are apostate. So that you are not walking in the truth. Read 1 John. We went through it at length, didn't we? Let him be to you as no one. See him in the grocery store. Oh, it's so good to see you. Isn't that weird? People that call you the devil and then hug your neck a year later in the grocery store? And what I want to do, I wish, it was, I, wish I felt the same. I've got a stick. I just say, I'm glad to see you. I'm continuing to pray for you. I hope that one day you're reconciled. And then they walk off. Are they forgiven? Absolutely. My friends, that, that doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Church discipline is, is a gift to the church. I got a whole lot of peas that are about to pop out of my mouth. You ready? Church discipline protects the gospel. It protects the gospel because we are correcting, like in 1 Timothy. See, there's always a tie here. It's all the stuff's coming out of this so that we can understand some of the application as we're going. There is always application in the New Testament letters. It's not always only about the gospel. It is therefore because of the gospel, this do. Okay? Our assurance is not in our doing. Our confidence is not in our doing. But it sure does make life better. It sure does give us joy. It sure does bring us into intimacy. And when we see reconciliation, Christ and His truth is upheld. Church discipline protects the gospel. It disavows any alternate views. So somebody, somebody in the congregation, you know, they're reading, they're thinking, they're philosophizing, they're doing all these sort of things. Hey, I got an idea. What about this? Yeah. How would Christ answer that? With a lamb, he would say, that's an interesting position. Let's talk more about it. Let's have some meetings and let's discuss it. Let's get the Bible out. Let's just have coffee and let's go over it. There'd be no animosity. There'd be no stress. There'd be no forcefulness. There'd be no anger. There'd be no suspicion. And then eventually, the word of God would be true. But there are very few people who actually love one another. Because part of loving one another is simply being able to receive the instruction of how to deal with it and to be satisfied in that instruction. So church discipline protects the gospel. Church discipline promotes humility. Because what, what do we do? What, is, what does Paul say? Those who are spiritual go to the one who sins, lest you also, oh this is John, I mean, uh, also be snared and do so as one who is a recipient of grace. Jesus gets into that, doesn't he? In verse 21, the unforgiving slave who's forgiven a bunch of debt and then goes and shakes down his neighbor for his $5 and the king finds out about it and sells all of his children and family and dogs and rabbits and everything else into slavery and puts him in jail. Because if we're not forgiving others, then how dare we say that we're forgiven? Church discipline provides boundaries. It sets up clear and present boundaries of what the church is supposed to do in every circumstance, what the church is supposed to say, how the elders are supposed to act, how the deacons are supposed to act, how the church is supposed to act, how we're supposed to receive, how we're supposed to reject. It sets boundaries so that we're not walking around like a child or a leaf tossed to and fro. Ah! We're not, I'm here, I'm not here. I believe you, I'm standing with you, I'm not with you. 
We know we're not to talk about it. We know we're not to gossip. We know we're not to be cynical. We know we're not to be bitter. We know we're supposed to pray. We know what we're supposed to do. And the elders oversee that. And it is a nightmare all the time when things are bad. When things are good, it's like, this is the best day of my life. But those boundaries protect you also by not allowing me to deal with it according to the world's wisdom. Church discipline promotes Christ, the mind of Christ. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Though he was God, he did not take equality with God. Let's do the King James. He thought it not robbery. Uh, did not take equality with God, something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, a slave, obedient unto death, even on a cross. Therefore God exalted him, that on the name of Jesus, he had him above all names, that every knee, Every time, Jesus is Lord. That's the mind. That is, we should all mimic Christ in that way. Every single occasion. It promotes the mind of Christ. Church discipline, as I've already said, permeates all aspects of life as a church. So it's always happening. There's always ways. If, if, you're, if you and I are at your house and we're working on something, there's always some corrective or formative way in which the Word of God will have influence over what we're doing, whether it be our attitude about it, our stewardship of it, or just the plain fact that we don't need what we're doing. And if you've ever done plumbing, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it plainly deals with error. Church discipline is the only, listen to this, the only and pl only plain way to handle doctrinal disputes. Corrective teaching, formative teaching. This is what the Bible says we should do. This is what the Bible says we should believe. Let's get back on the same page. Everybody sit down. And the person who refuses either of those is the offender. And there are many people in their hearts, if they ever hear me say that, they will say, that's not true. Yeah, but. That's a big old but. It'll keep you out of heaven. It's wider than the door frame. I'm just making a play on words. Narrow is the gate that leads to righteousness. Beloved, that's a gift of God to believe in the sovereignty of God, in the work of Christ Jesus, and He as our righteousness imputed to us. That is the only hope we have to enter the gates of heaven and eternal life. And it is a promise to the elect alone. And beloved, if we know this truth, we are reminded of that by the Spirit when the Word of God is instructed to us. Even when we do it with a smirk. Ah! He softens us. So those who refuse correction and instruction are to be treated as an unbeliever. Doesn't mean they are, but they must be. So that our only intimacy with them, if I dare use the word, is evangelism. It pursues love and it practices that unconditionally. And it purifies the church. Because as hard as it is, when we see things happen, it grows us closer together when we see reconciliation and unity. And it purges and purifies the church. There's another P. And the removal of those who aren't with it. It's easy, as I said two weeks ago, it's easy for people to just have a theological checklist and say, yep, 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 I'm with you. That doesn't mean you're with us. A bunch of people have had theological checklists with sublists and sublists, and sub but yet they refuse to listen to the shepherding of the church, of the Lord. And at the end of it all, the, the greatest thing about it is that it praises the Savior. It praises Him. It praises His glorious grace because it is all about knowing that we are recipients of God's grace and therefore we can exercise grace and patience with others. Beloved, there's never a time, listen to this, there's never a time when we should be in a hurry like someone's on fire, unless someone's on fire. When I was in the fifth grade, I was trying to get my brother Joshua in trouble. He wanted to call 
He wanted to call my Uncle Greg. He loved Greg. Still loves Greg. But he wanted to call my Uncle Greg, so I dialed Greg's number and actually dialed the fire department <laughs> on purpose. And he's, he thought it was Greg being funny, so he goes, the pots are on fire, and hung up the phone. Ten minutes later, woo! I got in big trouble. Big trouble. I thought I was going to prison, but it's Claxton. They like to crank the trucks up. So, but I did get in big trouble. Um, we don't act like that. We don't need to bring the fire trucks when there's no need. We don't need to bring the guns when there's no threat, because God is sovereign. He saved his people through the, through the Lord Jesus Christ and it is a finished work. And we proclaim that through our teaching and through our instruction and through our weeding out of error and weeding out people who believe error. But our hope is that they will believe the truth and then we rejoice in that. You know what? We've come to terms. We see. And we also have a responsibility to do the things. The very fact that we do the Lord's table every week is an act of obedience that we may reminisce and be united in the death of Christ. We may taste the same thing and, and experience these things together as a church. And it's to remind us of what God has done in Christ. So we praise the Lord when we do these things. We praise the Lord when we're patient. There we go. Church discipline is patient. Because love is patient. So with all of that, beloved, I just want to say that I love you with the affection of Christ. And I do so through my labor in prayer, and I do so through my labor in teaching, and I do so in my labor through constant fleshly, sometimes sinful <laughs> burden to do more. But if I can do nothing but what God has called me to, it is of great benefit to you. So please listen and learn that we might live together as a loving people. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for the truth of Christ that He Himself has taught us directly from His own words about church discipline. And so, Lord, as we worship, as we meet, as we gather, as we focus on those problem areas of our lives, no matter what it may be, we thank you that you are patient with us, that you are patient with your people, that you discipline those who you love because we are legitimately yours. You've adopted us in Christ. And Father, we pray for those who are unable to be with us. We pray, brother, Father, for, for Brother Jesse and the ministry he is doing. Lord, we pray for other congregations around us, Lord, who seem to be coming to the knowledge of the truth. Small but mighty. We thank you for the work of evangelism that takes place in our lives every day. Lord, we pray for our plans that they would be pleasing to you. That they would be purposeful according to the commands that you've given us. That what we are wanting to do and desiring to do would be genuine and pure and that we would see your people of our communities come to faith and join us in covenant to be a family father we pray for the possibility of church plants and bible studies around the country and around the world we pray for the raising of shepherds and pastors of leaders of teachers of scripture can affect intimacy and change according to the gospel in the lives of many. And so, Father, as we take this table today, remind us of why we even are able to pray and how we're able to stand before you righteous this day. Because of the blood of Christ, because of the cross of Christ, Jesus Christ, our righteousness. In his name we pray. Amen.